In this video, I'm going to talk about bleeding in early pregnancy. So first of all, early pregnancy refers to the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And bleeding can be due to a number of causes. We've got implantation bleed, ectopic pregnancy, miscarriage, and molar pregnancy. So we're first going to have a look at implantation bleed. This happens when the fertilized egg attaches to the lining of the uterus and causes a tiny bleed. Patients will present with very light spotting and typically won't have any pain. It occurs 6 to 12 days after conception and is pretty common in fact as it occurs in 30% of pregnancies. Now this is normal and it's very important to explain this to the patient and to reassure her. Now moving on we're going to be talking about ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is when an embryo implants outside the uterine cavity and it occurs in 11 per 1000 pregnancies in the UK. An ectopic pregnancy can implant in different places. Most commonly, it will implant in the fallopian tube. In fact, 95% of ectopic pregnancies occur in the fallopian tube. Now let's have a quick look at the anatomy of the fallopian tube. So the fallopian tube is divided into four main parts. We've got the fimbrial end, the infundibulum, the ampulla, and the isthmus. And 80% of ectopic pregnancies will occur in the ampulla. Now going back to our original diagram, so an ectopic pregnancy might also implant in the cornu of the uterus, in the ovary, in the cervix. They can also implant in the abdomen on an organ within the peritoneal cavity, such as the broad ligament. Sometimes they might also implant on a previous cesarean section scar. Now, what causes an ectopic pregnancy? So basically, this is due to a delay in the passage of an embryo from the ovum through the tube. And there are some possible risk factors which may be associated with this. These include pelvic inflammatory disease, tubal surgery, in vitro fertilization, a previous ectopic pregnancy, an intrauterine device, and smoking. Okay, good. So let's look a bit deeper now into what's going on and how this relates to the patient's symptoms. So once the ectopic pregnancy has implanted, it will start to grow and may give the usual symptoms of early pregnancy, such as nausea and vomiting. Sometimes the blood supply is insufficient to maintain the growth of the pregnancy and it will die. So the patient now will present with bleeding, PV, and abdominal pain, just like a normal miscarriage would present. Now, on the other hand, if the ectopic pregnancy continues to grow, at some point it will run out of space and it may rupture. And this causes massive hemorrhage and is a major emergency in gynae. These patients might present with bleeding PV, which is typically dark in colour, and in fact described as resembling prune juice. This is quite important when you're distinguishing an ectopic pregnancy from a miscarriage, where the patient will present with bright red bleeding. They might also present with abdominal pain, which can be very severe. They can also present with shoulder tip pain. And this occurs when the ectopic pregnancy is bleeding and the blood irritates the diaphragm, resulting in referred pain to the shoulder. And just as a reminder, this is due to the C3, C4, C5 dermatomes. If there is ongoing hemorrhage, they can also present with dizziness, fainting, and shock. Next, so on examination. When doing an abdo examination, you can identify abdominal tenderness. And on vaginal examination, they might have cervical excitation. And of course, in case of a ruptured ectopic, there will be signs of shock. Okay, so how do we manage these patients? So here I've divided the management depending on whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable. So looking at a patient who is hemodynamically stable first. So these patients will need a beta-HCG to be taken. Beta-HCG is human chorionic gonadotrophin and it is essentially a marker of pregnancy. So if the beta-HCG is low, and the patient is asymptomatic, we have two options for their management. 
We've got expectant management, where we will watch and wait, taking serial HCGs to see if the patient eliminates the ectopic on her own. Or we've got medical management, where we use methotrexate as treatment, um, which requires also close monitoring of the patient. Next, if the beta HCG is high and the patient is symptomatic now, surgical management is required. And I'm going to be talking about this a bit later on. Now, moving on to patients who are hemodynamically unstable. So, as in all emergencies, you always need to think ABC. That is airway, breathing and circulation. Once you're done from your ABC, you obtain IV access and take some bloods. So basically, we're going to need pre-op bloods because the patient is going to require surgery. We, of course, do a hit test to confirm pregnancy and an ultrasound scan to confirm the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy. Now, so what are the surgical options? We have two options. So most of the time, we go for a laparoscopic salpingectomy where the ectopic is removed with the entire fallopian tube. In cases where there is a problem with the contralateral tube, we can opt for a laparoscopic salpingostomy, where only the ectopic is removed and the rest of the fallopian tube is sutured back together. I hope that was helpful. In my next videos, I'm going to be talking about miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy. Thank you.